Okay, so we have seen that the angular portion of the Schrod Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, once we break it down into a radial piece and an angular piece, the angular piece of the Schrodinger equation looks like this. So we have this differential equation. Notice that we're not solving for a wave function anymore. We're solving for y, which is only the angular component of the hydrogen atom Schrodinger equation. But still, we've got a differential equation to solve. If we can figure out the function y that obeys this differential equation, if we take these derivatives of it and add it to these derivatives, we get back a particular constant. Uh, so that's what we're looking to do, is to find the solutions to this uh, differential equation for the function y of theta and phi. So as a start, we can, um, uh, if we do the following, if we take this equation and if we multiply by y to get rid of this term, and if we divide by r squared, for reasons I'll mention in just a second, then what this equation looks like is multiplying by y gets rid of this, dividing by r squared does that. And on this side, if I multiply by y and if I divide by r squared, then I've done the following to the equation. So that's what the, the uh, differential equation looks like now. And the reason I've done those two particular things is because this differential equation might look very familiar. This, in particular, the theta and phi portions of the kinetic energy term and the lack of a potential energy term looks exactly like the differential equation that we solved when we were studying the rigid rotor. So in particular, if I uh, notice that this alpha over r squared, if I identify that with the thing we called energy for the rigid rotor, and if I replace the mass of an electron with the uh, reduced mass for a diatomic molecule, if I replace m with mu, and if I replace alpha over r squared with e, that's exactly the, the same thing as the differential equation we solved when we were solving for the rigid rotor, rigid rotor uh, wave function. So the, that means two things which are uh, fairly convenient and somewhat remarkable. The first one is that, for some reason, the angular behavior of an electron around a hydrogen atom, the problem we're currently trying to solve. So we have an electron at some distance r away from a hydrogen nucleus, which I suppose is just a proton. That behaves exactly the same way quantum mechanically as if we have a diatomic molecule where we have one atom with mass one at some distance away from an atom with mass two. So drawing the diagrams makes it clear exactly why this is true. We just have two point masses interacting uh, uh, with no potential energy. Um, because we're only considering the right angular term with a fixed R. doesn't matter whether we call them a proton and an electron or whether we call them an atom and another atom. If, they, if we keep their uh, distance fixed and, and leave the radial uh, portion of the behavior for a, a different day, then at fixed R, a rigid rotor molecule behaves exactly the same as the angular behavior of, of an uh, electron and a hydrogen atom. So, uh, we've already solved this problem, as it turns out, uh, and uh, the solutions that we saw for the rigid rotor are going to be exactly the same as the solutions for this angular term in the hydrogen atom wave function. And what those looked like for the rigid rotor was some normalization constant, some polynomial, uh, that looks like a spherical harmonic, and then, and I guess I don't need the plus or minus, e to the i m phi, m could be a positive number or a negative number, and that reminds us that there's a whole sequence of these solutions. We can have the L equals zero, L equals one, L equals two solutions. Each L can have its own family of M's, ranging from negative L to positive L. So these, these are exactly what we wrote down for the rigid rotor wave functions. They're also exactly the same as the hydrogen atom angular terms. And just as a reminder, the zero, zero wave function was just some normalization constant with no angular dependence. The one, zero wave function was a different, if we want to label these, we can label them the zero, zero normalization constant or the one, zero normalization constant. 
the one zero wave function had some angular dependence in, in terms of the theta variable, and then the one one and the one negative one uh, wave functions for the rigid rotor looked like a normalization constant multiplied by sine theta, and then e to the i phi or e to the minus i phi, depending on uh, whether I have a plus one or a minus one here. So there's an infinite number of those wave functions, any L and any M that we insert into this equation. We've got uh, a particular polynomial in cosine theta or sine theta, an e to the uh, some number of i phi's and a normalization constant out front. And those are also the solutions for the angular behavior of the uh, hydrogen atom. The only last thing we have to consider is that energy means something slightly different now than it did before. Previously, our energy now corresponds to this alpha over r squared. So that alpha, this constant alpha that we wanted to know, if I take these derivatives of the angular function, what I get back is an alpha. Or in this new equation, what I get is alpha over r squared times the original function. So this out, the value of this alpha is r squared times what we used to think of as the energy of the rigid rotor. Those energies for the rigid rotor, the energy of the elf wave function uh, was this collection of constants, h squared over 8 pi squared used to be a mu for reduced mass, now it's me for the mass of an electron. R squared is in the denominator, and that all multiplies the quantum numbers L times L plus 1. Those were the energies of the rigid rotor. What that means now uh, for our value of alpha for the hydrogen atom, if I just take that energy and multiply by R squared, there's an R squared in the denominator, so the value of alpha just works out to be h squared over 8 pi squared mass of the electron, the r squared has gone away, and we still have an L times an L plus 1. So that's uh, the significant conclusions we've got so far for the angular behavior of an electron in a hydrogen atom. It obeys these, uh, any one of these functions for the angular component of the wave function, and the value of alpha that we'll need to solve the radial equation is this collection of constants times some quantum numbers.